Okay, so I'll, I'm just going to make a, a short presentation um, summarising just some of the, the key issues um, that were identified on hydration status. So how do we define it and how do we measure it? So I think this figure is probably familiar to many people and I think it illustrates quite well the different hydration statuses that we've got. So euhydration is the situation that hopefully most of us are in at the moment. And it's not one set point. It is, I guess, a sinusoidal wave. We gain a little bit of water, we lose a little bit of water, but we stay within the eu-hydration band, and that's what our body's homeostasis is trying to do all the time. If we gain an excess amount of water, then we can move into a situation of overhydration or hyperhydration. If we lose an excessive amount of water, then we move into a situation of hypohydration or underhydration. So euhydration is our normal body water content, whatever that normal is for each individual. But we've got a continuous loss. We're all, we, we're all losing water at the moment. We're all breathing, losing moisture in our air, losing water through the skin. And we've got intermittent replacements. So when we eat or when we drink, we typically take in some water. So we've got that continuous loss, but intermittent replacement but we're trying to stay within our own individual band of euhydration. So if that is euhydration, what are our boundaries? And when do we move outside that euhydration band and become overhydrated or become underhydrated? And that's, I guess, in some ways a very simple question, but it's, it's not necessarily so simple to answer. When we look at the literature, it, I guess the values that we see is that our, our body water is probably, or our body weight or body water is regulated to within around 0.2 to 0.5% of our daily body mass. So for a 70 kilogram person, that's maybe plus or minus 150 mils or up to plus or minus 350 mils, depending on the environment that we're in, depending on the physical activity levels of the individual. But that's probably the extent of the wave that we've got. So we can therefore gain or lose quite a lot of water, but still be eu-hydrated. So we're, in some ways you could say we're designed to cope with a little bit of overhydration and a little bit of underhydration because that is still within our eu-hydration band. But it's when we move without that that we become hyperhydrated or hypohydrated. So that's, that's the first thing. Very simple to say, yes, we should be eu-hydrated, but we've got a little bit of, of body water content to play with there. So that's what euhydration is, and that's, I guess, what most of us, most of the time, are striving to be at. Although there are certain circumstances when people don't want to be euhydrated, and we probably won't talk about those here, but I have a feeling some of the original research will talk about those later on. Other hydration states, then. Hypohydration is really the one I'm going to focus on today, and that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of hydration status markers. When, what hydration status markers have we got to identify when someone is hypohydrated rather than euhydrated? Now, of course, there are situations when we might want to identify if someone is hyperhydrated, overhydrated, but I'm not going to talk about that today in the presentation, but we can discuss it if people want to. So hypohydration, then, is a state of a water deficit, so a lower body water content than, than the ideal for a particular individual. Um, so below that sinusoidal wave. There are probably different types of hypohydration, um, and I've summarized the three of them here. So we can see people who have got hypertonic hypohydration, and we typically see that after someone has gone through a period of heavy sweating, for example. So those people will have a decreased blood volume because they've lost water from the body, but we'll see an increased serum osmolality because the sweat that they lose is hypotonic with regards to their, in comparison to their body water. So you see an increase in the concentration of the water that's left in the body. So hypertonic hypohydration. And that is a very, very common one that we see people in the heat, people who are physically active. We can also see isotonic 
dehydration. And that, if we see that, is perhaps most typically seen with a complete fast. And the individual will have a lower body water content, but their blood chemistry is normal. We don't see an increase or a decrease, at least in tonicity in the, the osmolality. Other issues in their blood chemistry may be quite different, but in terms of the tonicity, um, so we can define that um, isotonic dehydration. And the reason why I'm classifying this according to tonicity will perhaps become a bit more obvious when we look at um, some of the markers. And then the third one that we can see that we can see is hypotonic dehydration. And that may be seen when someone takes diuretic drugs. And with that, there'll be a reduced body water content, but often a decreased serum osmolality and sodium concentration as well. If the diuretic drug has caused an excessive um, urinary excretion of sodium as well, along with the water. Um, so we do see different categories of, um, of dehydration, but perhaps um, in healthy individuals, the, the first one is by far the most common. So in terms of hydration status mar biomarkers then, um, a few things that we need to think about. Firstly, when we're looking at these markers, we've got to remember that there is no one total body water content in an individual that is their eu-hydration. So we are looking for a marker that is, we've got a, no, a normal range that we want it to detect and then to find someone out with that normal range. We're not regulating around a, a specific point. So the biomarker should probably be sensitive and accurate enough to detect body water fluctuations of around 3% of total body water. So if the U hydration, normal U hydration range was around 0 0.2 to 0.5% of body mass, then that's probably the level um, of marker we want to be able to detect and to, related to total body water content. Um, or perhaps fluctuations of around 2% of body mass for the average person. Um, because after they should then be out with their new hydration curve and into a situation of hypohydration. The biomarker probably also needs to be practical. Um, the practicalities will differ depending on the reason why hydration status wants to be measured and, and who is measuring it. So in terms of time, how quickly does an answer need to come back? What is the cost? Um, so why is this marker, why does this person need to be assessed? Um, and how much money can be put towards making that assessment? Um, and the technical expertise, who is doing the assessment? It may be in a clinical setting where there's a large amount of expertise, but we see hydration status being assessed um, out in the athletic population very frequently or out in the industrial setting very frequently, for example. And the people making those assessments frequently will have no medical or bioscience type background. So um, that will influence what sort of measurements they may be making or ought to be making. So these are some common markers of hypohydration that, that we see when we look at the literature. Um, so body mass or body mass change, measures of total body water, bioelectrical impedance analysis, various blood volume, plasma volumes, and changes of those volumes, plasma osmolality or serum osmolality, then a variety of urinary markers um, of concentration, so specific gravity, osmolality, conductivity, 24-hour urine volume we see being used, urine color, perceptual ratings of thirst, and then there are a variety of other markers, um, vena cava diameter, changes in, um, heart rate and blood pressure with changes in posture. You see all sorts of things in the literature um, being used to assess high, um, hypohydration. So I'm just going to focus on a few that are perhaps most commonly used um, and discuss some of those issues. And I guess what I will say here is um, my remit was to look at really markers of hypohydration, but in the healthy, the otherwise healthy population. So I'm not thinking about a clinical population who have many other issues going on with them. So that was really what I was asked to look at. Body mass and body mass change in some ways is out there as the gold standard method of assessing hypohydration. 
um, or at least change in hydration state from a eu-hydration to a hypohydration and it's the marker that many others are compared against so in, in that way it is put forward I guess as the, um, the gold standard marker and the reason for that is any change in body mass over a relatively short time scale is really going to be due to water change within the body. There's not many other components that we will lose or gain very, very quickly. Um, obviously, we may, our body weight may, will change if we eat a, a meal or something like that, a solid meal. But so long as we can exclude all those confining factors, if our body weight goes down very rapidly over the course of an hour or so, then it is probably water that is being lost from the body. And a one gram mass change is equivalent to approximately a one milliliter water change. Um, but there are potential sources of error. Um, so if someone is exercising, for example, and perhaps quite intensely, then things like substrate mass will be changing as substrate is used to, to fuel the exercise, water of oxidation being produced, water stored with glycogen being released, and then there may be ingested fluid or fecal losses. And it, so you do need to have an idea of what that individual has been doing over this acute time period where you see body mass change. But if you know what they've been doing over that time, you can account for everything. Then if body mass does go down over that time period, then probably it's a good indication that that's water loss from the body. And you can quantify whether that's moving them into a hypohydrated state. In terms of using body mass per se as a, a marker of, as a, I guess, a marker of hydration status at a single time point, um, that has been looked at by Sam Chauvron and his colleagues um, who, who work um, in the US military environment and so are interested in it from the point of view of soldiers being active in a hot environment. And what they looked at, body mass, and basically their conclusion was if an individual can identify their, their regular stable body mass, and if that is known, then simply identifying a change in body mass is probably good enough to give a reasonable estimate of a change in hydration status, a, a hypohydration. And what they said was that three consecutive measurements of body mass can provide an accurate assessment of daily variability in body mass. So three seems to be enough to give an individual's normal body mass, which can then be used um, from which a body mass change can be identified. Um, it's less than 1% for active men in the heat when they follow regular fluid replacement guidelines. Um, and so it's sufficiently stable um, parameter for potential daily fluid balance monitoring. But of course, there are the limitations. It can't be applied to long-term hydration assessment when people may well change their body mass for other reasons, gaining fat, gaining um, muscle mass, or losing either of those components as well. Um, it possibly isn't um, always useful in females whose body mass may change with um, hormones over the menstrual cycle, so for some females it may not be um, particularly useful, and it may not be useful when people are going through a heat acclimatization program, when their body mass will be changing as they acclimatize to the heat. So there are some qualifications on it, but otherwise it does seem to provide a, a stable body mass which then changes in body mass can be quantified from. There are a variety of blood-based measures which have been investigated for their potential for hydration um, status assessment um, that, that you see in the published literature. Um, and again, we're thinking here about normal, healthy individuals who don't have any other issues. So when you look at the literature, you see people using these measures here um, trying to quantify hydration um, status assessment. So hemoglobin concentration, hematocrit, plasma or serum osmolality, sometimes using the um, water balance hormones, um, vasopressin concentration, and there are also papers looking at a variety of other hormones to try and identify um, hydration status um, measures from it. Probably the most um, commonly used um, marker for hydration status assessment in healthy individuals in literature is plasma or serum osmolality. Um, I guess the one thing I will flag up is that because though we sometimes get different, there's different 
reasons why people become hypohydrated, whether it's sweat loss or excess diuresis or restriction of fluid intake or fasting, that can change the balance of electrolytes that we lose with the water, which is clearly going to influence our plasma or serum osmolality anyway. So that is an issue, certainly, on using plasma or serum osmolality as a marker. What I will say, though, is probably, to be fair, um, to the papers that have used it. It has most commonly been used in the situation of people sweating to become dehydrated. Um, so physical exercise, hot environments, that type of scenario. When we typically we would expect serum osmolality to, to increase. But we know that this, this sweat that people lose to dehydrate them is very, very variable in composition in terms of its sodium content. It can be very dilute. 20 millimoles per litre sodium or less, or it can be very, very concentrated up at 70, 80 millimoles per litre in healthy individuals and above 100 if we're thinking of individuals with cystic fibrosis. So we have got a big range anyway which can have an impact on the amount of sodium that's been lost which will impact the values that we see. But looking at some studies where this has been investigated, this is a study where people have simply restricted their fluid intake for a period of, of 37 hours with a small restriction of food intake as well. And this is serum osmolality over the duration of that 37 hours. So a control trial where body mass remained more or less stable with a, up to a half a 0.6% body mass loss by um, 37 hours. Um, in comparison to the trial where they restricted their fluid intake by just voluntarily not drinking. And there was an increase in serum osmolality up to around 292 milliosmoles. It seemed to peak at 24 hours and then remain relatively stable thereafter. When we look at the literature then from a different type of um, dehydration, and this time one that occurs with sweating where there is a lot more studies in the literature, we see this type um, of result here. So each symbol is a different study from the literature. So tending to with the greater degree of body mass loss, so from studies for as low as 1% body mass loss up to around 5% body mass loss, we see various increases in serum osmolality. So that is the rationale that people that use that as a marker have been working on. Um, and Recently, there's been a lot more attention looking at serum osmolality as a marker. And there's a couple of different conclusions that we see in the literature coming out. And I think just, it's just going to take a little bit of time to tease out where current consensus opinion is standing. There's a group of papers that are saying that serum plasma osmolality really can't be used as a, you walk in the door, I take a blood sample, Yes, I've measured it, you're dehydrated or you're euhydrated. That's probably, I think, where I sit at the moment. I don't think we can use it. There's so much variability. There's a normal range of serum osmolality. But there are papers coming out that are saying, this one came out last year, 2010, it was published, saying it's the only useful marker for static, so one-time dehydration assessment. Um, largely based on the study they've done with a lot of statistical analysis. I think we just need a bit more research to tease out where finally we're going to sit. At the moment, I'm in the top camp. At the moment, I respect the paper of the, the second one, and it's a reasonable paper, but I think I would like to see some more research at the moment. So on to urinary measures. It's probably the most commonly one that is used out in the healthy population in terms of hy measuring hydration status. And really, these all are based on the same thing. It's looking at a measure of urine concentration. The rationale being, if you're euhydrated, then when you get rid of the waste products from the body in your urine, you get rid of them in a reasonably large volume, so it's quite dilute. If you're hypohydrated, and you're getting rid of those same waste products from the body in your urine, you're getting rid of them in a smaller volume because you're trying to conserve body water, so it's more concentrated. That is a simple rationale for all the urinary measures, whether it's urine osmolality, um, whether it's urine-specific gravity, or whether in a very much field setting, it's simply urine color that's being looked at. It's all a measure of concentration based on that rationale. And we do see differences in hydration status, in urine concentration 
when people are in different hydration statuses. So the same study again, people are going about their normal everyday lives and here is um, morning, um, sorry, urine osmolality over these time periods. It's relatively low when people are eating and drinking as normal. When people have restricted their fluid intake over 37 hours, the urine osmolality increases. We see a similar thing with urine osmolality and sweat loss. So this time, this is individuals who were dehydrated from sweating and looking at their morning osmolality compared to individuals eating and drinking, going about their normal lives. When they're euhydrated, the osmolality was averaging around 700 milliosmoles per kilogram, and it was averaging around 900 milliosmoles per kilogram when people had lost 2% of their body mass with sweat. Larry Armstrong, quite some time ago now, looked at urine colour as a potential field assessment um, measure of hydration status, linking in with the osmolality measurements, and published this eight colour um, scale. And he reported it to be, um, to show a reasonably good relationship to osmolality and specific gravity. So if you accept that osmolality and specific gravity are acceptable measures to give an indication of hydration status, then if you're in a situation where you've got no laboratory, um, so a military city, setting, an industrial setting, and a sports setting out in the field, then you can use it um, as, a, as an indication. But you do see there's a huge amount of spread. So it certainly, it is only in indicative and can really only be used when there's no laboratory there. It shouldn't be used um, when some of the other tools are available. Um, so just to finish up then, in recent years, people to some of the other measures, saliva parameters, I guess, is one that's been looked at reasonably recently in terms of um, hydration status assessment, can it be used? This study published by Neil Walsh and his colleagues where they dehydrated and rehydrated people over a time period and this time looked at the, the concentration of, um, of sal the, the saliva osmolality, so the concentration of saliva, and they found that it, it more or less um, mirrored some of the, the, the body mass changes and some of the plasma um, and urinary measures as well. So they said that potentially um, it could be there as a hydration status marker. Again, in a setting when um, no invasive measurements are going to be made. Um, so that was the, con the conclusion that it appears to track hydration changes. But there really has been relatively small amounts of research um, and there is a huge amount of inter-individual uh, variability which may limit its practical use. And again, there's some confounding factors then, um, particularly if people eat or drink, oral hygiene practices, things like that can very much influence the findings that we've got for that. Thirst has been looked at, um, just people's perception of thirst. Um, as a hydration status marker because there's been a lot of debate in the literature of should you bother giving anybody drink volume recommendations because if we say physiology works, then we shouldn't need to give them a drink recommendation. I, I don't buy that because we wouldn't have obesity if hunger worked. Um, but that has been out there, so it has stimulated people then to look at thirst as a, a potential hydration status marker. And I, I think really it's a, it's a long way from being a marker because really what is thirst? I, I agree there is a true physiological thirst that we've got in response to our changing tonicity in the body, but I don't think that's what we work on on an everyday basis. I'm getting incredibly thirsty now, but I've got a dry mouth because I've been speaking a lot. Um, but I'm not dehydrated, I know that. So um, I think there are some limitations there. So to finish up then, my conclusions, I don't think there's any one biomarker that's available to accurately determine hydra our hydration status. I just don't think that we've got it. A combination of biomarkers is probably likely to give the best insight. So I may try and get somebody's normal body mass, see if their body mass has changed, and get a urine sample to measure osmolality as well. And try and use the two to give me a picture. That would probably be my first choice way to go in a healthy population. 
But I really strongly feel that all the markers that I've talked about can never measure or determine hydration status. I don't think we've got a tool to do it, other than maybe body water. But they can give us an <coughs> estimate. So I do think they're giving us an estimate rather than a definite, you are dehydrated <coughs> or you are you hydrated. Um, in this healthy population when we're not talking about large amounts of dehydration. Spot checking is usually of most interest in this population. You know, it's the, it's the athlete turning up for the start of their training. Are they dehydrated or not? Uh, and so that has some confounding factors, um, issues and knowing what their normal values are and how it's changed. Expense, speed, ease and reliability, consistency of measures is important. Giving the individuals that are often making these measures, we're not, I'm not talking here about a clinical setting. And for pretty much all of these measures, a knowledge of what someone has been doing for the couple of hours beforehand is important because somebody may be very, very dehydrated, drink a liter of plain water very, very quickly, and they will get a diuresis after drinking that plain water, even though they're still dehydrated. And you may see that as a dilute urine sample, just as they try and um, re-establish the sodium water balance in the body and therefore give a false reading. Um, so I think that knowledge is important. Um, so sorry for the very quick run through, but thank you for your attention. <coughs>